up, everybody? <laughs> new vibes today, huh? Uh, yeah, we do have some new vibes. Yes, if you guys, well, I'm sure a lot of you noticed, we have a new intro song today. I'm sure some of you are a little sad. Yeah, I'm sure, but I'm sure a lot of you are also relieved, like me. <laughs> it's personally. the end of an era here on Mile Higher. It is the start of a new chapter. I mean, <laughs> it's let's, about time. <laughs> let's be honest, Dubstep yeah. was out like. <laughs> Well, 10 years ago, <laughs> let's be honest. People that have actually seen every episode know that I talked major shit about that song. You did in the first episode. We played it in and it was supposed to be a temporary thing while we got one made. Nope. And then we tried to get some made. We never liked how they turned out. And then we got fresher and just kind of gave up. And I think part of it is because it's really loud, right? It's really kind of annoying. It is. I'm sure it like scares some of <laughs> it you does. when it comes on or you're watching yeah. some other video that all of a sudden a mile higher yeah. episode plays. It's like, I think some people are going like, to miss shit, it. Turn it down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, but yeah, like someone commented like a week or two ago that was just like, please change your intro song. And I was like, dude, I feel you. And I think we forget sometimes we even have that because we don't play it in the studio. Janelle adds it in post. Yeah. So we don't hear it right. ever. I was going to say, I don't forget about it. My laptop speakers <laughs> don't forget about it. Oh, I'm sure they don't. <laughs> no, but yeah, the but new one's so good. It's so good. And it's made by someone here yeah. on the Mile Higher Media team. That's yes. Josh's brother, Joel. Yes, he is uh, one of our digital producers here, mm -hmm. my producer on Lights Out. And yeah, he's a very talented musician he and he's got some amazing skills when it comes to just like making soundscapes and mm -hmm. and ambient songs like that. And yeah, he it turned out really, really good. good. We were just job. like, Joel, please, we need a new <laughs> intro song. Reimagined. I still wanted the word hire to be in there. And he did that mm -hmm. really good. I love the vibes of it. I know some of you, you know, you like how it's been. We've done things a long time like this, mm -hmm. but change is good. It is good. I think. And he's now made all three of our shows. Or yeah. Made by, which is like so cool. All yeah. three original shows. pieces. That's like, true. Which is really cool. So that is a good point. And they all he fit did the, the show. Sesh, he did lights out. Yeah. They fit the shows so well. They do. So thank you, Joel. Thank you, <laughs> Joel. You're, You're the best. Hire Joel. Yes. yes. We will have all his info linked below in his YouTube channel. He's so talented. He's got yeah, a YouTube channel, some original stuff on there mm -hmm. too. He's actually on Spotify as well. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So we'll put, put those links for you. But yeah, that it's definitely kind of sets the tone, I think, more appropriately mm -hmm. for our show. We've yes. always felt kind of weird, you know, yeah. covering true crime cases and like we're introing it with a mm -hmm. mode step, dubstep <laughs> song. Yeah. So it's like. We didn't want to change it. We've been wanting to change it for a while, but we knew people were really attached to it. And we just wanted to find the right thing when we did replace it because we don't want like a new intro song every few months. Yeah. But I think I'm really happy with this. Me too. Me too. Very chill vibes here on Mile Higher. Yes. So what are we talking about this week? Today we are getting into a very interesting case that is so famous. I'm sure pretty much everyone viewing, if you're into true crime, you know who Amanda Knox is and you've probably heard at least some of the details about this case. We have not covered it on Mile Higher. I know I covered it on my YouTube channel, but Josh has never really got to say no. what he thinks about it. And no. you've been interested in this case for years. We've been interested in this case since yeah. before we were even doing true crime content. You know? Yeah, we originally watched the Amanda Knox kind of documentary that's on Netflix from like, I think 2016 or something. Yeah, We watched it a few years ago and I just remember being like completely just blown away by this whole whole case just from start to end it's just such a it's a weird one there's just so many different facets to it and it's it's one of those that really makes you think you know you it really makes you think about everybody who is involved and you know mm -hmm. is does amanda knox have some you know is she guilty of this crime is she innocent mm -hmm. and obviously as of right now she's been acquitted of it but mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I'm still, I still feel like I'm on the fence sometimes on, yeah. on things. And that's how I feel too. It's, it's very difficult because I don't think this is one of those cases that we'll never know what really happened. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm afraid, but yeah, most likely not. It's definitely a very interesting Which is such one. a shame. I mean, I feel so bad for Meredith's family and all of this because it's been now just so overshadowed by all the drama. Oh, and, yeah. It's like all about Amanda Knox. Mm -hmm. Like she became this like, mm -hmm almost celebrity as mm -hmm. you know which is crazy that people get famous off of a true crime case like this and i'm sure she she wishes she was yeah like, no i i would imagine you would i mean who would want to be known as foxy noxy you yeah, know like, that's the name they had for her all over the place which apparently translates into italian mm -hmm. as evil, evil fox, fox or like mm -hmm. you know like the evil you know kind mm -hmm. of like this you know one you can't trust the sneaky mm -hmm. evil evil person so 
Yeah, this is a, this is a wild one. So it is. So before we dive into this case, I also want to thank our sponsors for today. We've got Function of Beauty, Raycon, Native, Candid, CEO, and Third Love. But let's go ahead and and jump in. Let's just start from the very beginning. I think you always got to start with you know the main person in this case, and really what this whole story really revolves around is Amanda Knox. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Meredith Kircher is a huge. You know, she's a victim in this case, but. Most of the reporting has been about Amanda. Right, right. I mean, it's one of those cases. Yeah, right. Where the media like saw an opportunity for a juicy story and Mm -hmm. they took it, which I feel like the media is just this double edged sword. It's like Mm -hmm. sometimes cases don't get enough coverage and you want media Mm -hmm. attention. But then there's cases where the media is able to really drum up this, you know, juicy story with all this gossip and all of these different factors that people find intriguing and, and want to know mm-hmm. about and then they just blow it up and it ends up being this larger than life situation and then on top of that this all goes down in italy where amanda knox is an exchange mm-hmm. student mm-hmm. yeah it's a pretty crazy story but i think that's a good point that the media really is a double-edged sword in so many ways because in a lot of cases you absolutely need coverage it's like the most vital thing for the case but then at the same time it creates all these problems especially for families. So it becomes to the point where they need it, but it also is like detrimental. to Right. And it just goes to show you that there is a reason why the authorities, especially when it's an active investigation, don't like the media being around because it can affect their work Mm -hmm. and it can affect the outcome of these cases. And a lot of times it's not in the right way. You know, justice Mm -hmm. ends up getting, falsely served i guess you could say it ends up being you know kind of the shit show because the media is just like you know you know pitchforks and and torches like oh, we need somebody who's the culprit who is the one that's gonna you know gonna fry for this like who are they gonna you know get to plaster on the front page and be like this is the evil one that did this heinous crime and when they don't have that or they have to wait they don't like that mm-hmm. and so in other countries especially you know this kind of thing it happens, but it doesn't happen where, you know, you have an American involved and it ends up, you know, becoming this worldwide story. So yeah, this is just such a the government and everyone getting it. Yeah, it makes sense why Amanda Knox, this whole case just blew up. Mm-hmm. So let's begin with Amanda Knox's background, a little bit about where she comes from, because I think it's very important to understand who she is as a person uh, to really try to figure out you know is she capable of murder is she capable of doing this type of crime well i think that almost becomes kind of irrelevant in this conversation though because you know we can like judge who she is and who we think she is all day but it's like without evidence that's the biggest thing in this case right is there it's just there's a reason it was acquitted yeah Um, exactly well and that that's the thing i think everybody's entitled to their opinion and what you believe about any case and and who you think did the crime. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the way our criminal justice system works and it works across the world is there has to be evidence to support, you know, Mm -hmm. beyond a reasonable doubt that this person actually committed the crime. And if there's not that evidence there to support that, then you have, I mean, you have to acquit, you know, you can't charge somebody if there's no evidence of the crime because this is their life. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, not only did the victim lose their life, but now a person might be falsely imprisoned Mm -hmm. and they didn't actually do the crime. So it's, it's very tough because I'm also understand that the family of, you know, Meredith Kircher, she wants, Mm -hmm. they want justice to be done. Of course they do. Yeah. It's horrible what happened to her. So it is, it's a brutal, really brutal case. And I, I, again, it's a shame how much she gets overshadowed in all this, but it is okay. So Amanda Knox, she's born in Seattle, but she grew up living in a middle-class suburban neighborhood with her parents, Etta and Curtis and her younger sister, Deanna, and her parents were divorced, but they lived really close together. So it wasn't, I mean, she still stayed close with everybody. Um, and then they both ended up getting remarried. Her stepfather, Chris Mellis helped raise her and her sister and her father and stepmother, Cassandra, had two daughters who were Amanda's half-sisters, Ashley and Delaney. And they were a very close-knit family, and Amanda had a very happy childhood. In high school, she went to Seattle Preparatory School, which is a private Catholic school that emphasizes discipline and academics. 
Catholic school, man. That sounds intense. I know yeah. people that went to Catholic school. Sounds very structured. I'll say. Yeah, structure is the right word. Yeah. <laughs> but Amanda did really well in school and was a very well-rounded student. She played sports, excelled in English, and sang in the choir. She graduated in 2005 and went to the University of Washington to study German, Italian, and creative writing. She was known to be a very quirky, goofy, and free-spirited girl who always was looking for a new adventure. When she was in college, she felt a little bit behind because she felt like she didn't have a lot of life experience. So she wanted to get out of her comfort zone, be a little more independent, self-reliant. So she thought a good way to switch things up was to go to a different country. So when she was 20, she decided to study abroad in Italy, and she spent a year in the university town of Perugia, which is the capital city of Italy's beautiful Umbria region. Mm. God, it looks so gorgeous. I would love to go to Italy one day. I know. I was always jealous of people that were like, you know, doing the foreign exchange programs. Yeah. I was like, damn, I would love to do that. My parents did that. I yeah. wish I did. It'd be but. so cool, but also kind of like hard too. <laughs> No, they say it's easier. Oh, Even yeah. Amanda really? was saying in her in the documentary we like watched, vacation. she was like, I thought it was going to be a lot of work, but it was barely any work. Yeah, one what? of my stepbrothers went to all the fuck around Europe. Mm. And um, he's, I mean, I think he did it twice even. Wow. I mean, it, I'm pretty sure it was like a party the whole time with like yeah. a little bit of class here and there. That's what my parents told me. <laughs> yeah. is like it was the easiest year of college. It was yeah. the easiest time we were in school. And it was a lot of like art classes and yeah. what? Le- poetry and things like that. They'll make you yeah. write essays well, in like you write Italian essays. and stuff? It's no, not, not hard Italian. You're taking cur- like coursework. English classes though. I mean, I guess it depends on what you're studying yeah, exactly. Yeah, depends. But, but yeah, Amanda said that she had so much free time that she ended up getting a job because she had so much. She was like, wow, this yeah. is like no work. And I'll you still get, get a college job. credit towards your degree too, I believe. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So it's just like it's a great deal. It's basically just <laughs> we're all involved. Mm-hmm. Get credit to travel, yeah. and, and mm-hmm. live in another culture. Hey, it's life experience. I think it should be like a. I mean, if it was more affordable, wouldn't that be so cool? If it was just a mandatory in school that everyone honestly goes? It should be. I feel like people need to get out of this country for a little while. Oh yeah, especially Americans. We could really use it. We're so fucking get some clueless. perspective <laughs> and culture. <laughs> it's true though. So Perugia has a very large student population and was called the Artistic Center of Italy. And Amanda thought that this is where she would find herself, you know, in a beautiful Italian city, learning about art and history, immersing herself in the culture. She moved in on September 20th, 2007. She rented a room on the ground floor apartment of a cottage, which is normally called a flat in Europe. And then four male students were actually renting the basement of their apartment. But the neighborhood was kind of sketchy. The male students played basketball at a nearby court. And at the same time, drug dealers would hang out right around them. So hmm. it was a little dicey, but for hey, Italy, probably. it's giving her character, right? It's yeah. giving her that independence she was looking for. They got that Italian weed. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> but she loved that it was close to the university and had amazing views of the surrounding hillsides. To Amanda, this was perfect. She had three roommates, two Italian women in their late 20s, and a fellow exchange student as well, 21-year-old Meredith Kircher. So Meredith Kircher was born on December 28, 1985, to parents John and Arlene. And she also had three other siblings, Stephanie, Lyle, and John, and she grew up in Coolsdon, which is a town in South London. And her family and her friends called her Mez. She was always a very popular girl who made friends very easily. She was very bright and had a great sense of humor. And she was just that kind of person that would walk into a room and and light it up, put smiles on everybody's faces. And as a kid, she took ballet, gymnastics, and karate. And she was always graceful and strong, both physically and mentally. Meredith was actually going to college to get a degree in European studies. And she started at Leeds University and then moved to Italy on September 1st, 2007. And she chose to live at the flat that she shared with the others because it had this stunning view from it. There was like this whole like valley mm-hmm. right below. It looks absolutely beautiful. It does. And when she moved in, her and Amanda got along very well. They actually liked to lay out on the terrace together and sunbathe and chat about their lives and bond over both being foreigners in a new city. So the first few weeks that Amanda was in Italy, she had a blast exploring the city and getting to know her new roommates. She thought it was super cool to be living with a sophisticated British woman and two Italian women. Her world was opening up for the first time in her life. She was thrilled that she'd be spending a whole year there, improving her language skills and making tons of new friends. So she thought the program at the university would be demanding, but 
she actually found that the classes were quite easy and she had more time than expected. So she actually found a part-time job. She was hired to work at a restaurant in a bar called Chic. Le was, Chic. Le Chic. Yeah. Which was owned by 38-year-old Patrick Lumumba. And Patrick was actually born in the Congo and he had been in Perugia for about 10 years. And people in the neighborhood knew him and liked him very much. He actually opened the restaurant in August to help support his wife and kid. So Amanda was hired to help bring in more business, serve drinks, and socialize with customers. She was supposed to be flirty, but that really didn't come naturally for her. In Seattle, she was a cute, quirky girl, but in Perugia, she was a beautiful, blonde American girl. So she wasn't used to all the attention that she got in Italy, and she found it to be a little overwhelming. Mm. Her new roommates would come by the bar in order to support her, and she also saw people from all around the neighborhood. I mean, honestly, that's kind of a great job to have. It's oh, like yeah. a waitress. You get to socialize with people. While you're studying abroad, that's like the perfect job. And it sounded like she was really hired to socialize, bring people in, like make it cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, being American in a foreign mm-hmm. country like that, it does bring attention to you because mm-hmm. not a lot of people haven't met an American before. And like mm-hmm. there's some like that's weird like fascination weird. with Americans like in other Why? countries. Hmm. I, I feel like, you know, in our travels, I know we've. You know, people are always like kind of interested in hearing, you know, normally they're like, what the fuck's going on over there? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> How are you guys holding it together over there? Oh my God. I'm like we True. really don't know. <laughs> okay. So let's get into Raffaele. So in late October, Amanda and Meredith went to a classical music concert. And that's where Amanda met this guy named Raffaele. AKA Harry Potter lookalike. <laughs> yes. Harry Potter lookalike, which she really liked that because she was really into Harry Potter. She was. There was an interview of her. Well, it's not even an interview. It's a video clip her sister took talking about how she had planned to read the German version of Harry Potter. And then she was going to read the Italian version when she was in Italy. And so she had this whole obsession with Harry Potter even going over there. Yes. She was like really into this Harry Potter phase. And then she meets this guy who kind of looks like Harry Potter. She was into him. It seems like the more she hung out with him, the more he he started dressing like. Harry yeah, Potter. I know. He was like, like oh, he was like, oh, she's into this. <laughs> yeah, I'll be your Harry Potter. You be my uh, Hermione. Oh yeah, I thought <laughs> Harry. No. Yeah, I was gonna say what the Whoa. hell, Jenny. Sorry. Yeah, Damn, I'm gonna get Ooh, ripped for that one. Ripped. Sorry, it's been a little while since I've brushed up on my Harry Potter. <laughs> we need to like binge all lore. the movies one night. I keep asking you to, but you keep denying me. Well, because so. I'm always tired, and that's a long. <laughs> that sounds like a that's chore. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> That's a commitment. <laughs> it's not a chore. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so Raffaele Solicito. Nice job. Well done. Thanks. That was actually spot on. I practiced all morning. <laughs> he was born on March 26, 1984 to a wealthy Italian family in Southern Italy in the city of Giovinazzo. Damn. Giovinazzo. Giovinazzo. Come on. Use some of that Get Italian Get that Italian. Player. Giovinazzo. You're like what it out. 40% Italian. I let's, am. Let's I'm it. pathetic. I've never been. I got to get to Italy. My grandma was like, go to Italy before you have kids. I know. Isn't, isn't her family like from Sicily? Area? <laughs> no. Uh, Naples. My Is it Naples? From Naples. Oh, yep. Naples. Anyway, he and his sister, Vanessa, lived with their mother after their parents divorced. And then his father, who was a successful doctor, remarried. Raffaele moved to Perugia in 2003 to study computer science. And then two years later, his mother sadly died of either a heart attack or suicide. And it was really sudden and very hard on him. And there were conflicting reports about what actually happened. So no one really knows. But there was no autopsy ever done. Hmm. After his mother's death, though, Raffaele spent a year studying in Germany before moving back to Perugia, and his father paid for him to move into his own apartment instead of staying at school. So with all his education and time living away from home, Raffaele was not very experienced with women. He was shy and a little self-conscious. Yeah, just like Harry Potter. (laughs) Is that how he... Yeah, he was a little shy. He really is. I mean, he kind of embodies that character. (laughs) Maybe he's related to Daniel. Radcliffe. Is that his name? God, yeah. please tell me that's his, okay, yeah, that's his name. <laughs> okay, great. Wow, I'm actually shocked you know that. Thank you, you so much. Yeah, I'm impressed. Normally you don't know actors. Now who's Ron? <laughs> I, he's the little red-haired dude. He's, yeah, but who's actor? Uh, <laughs> fuck if I know. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, anyways, so back to the concert. So Meredith left this concert early, but Amanda noticed Raffaele. She couldn't keep her eyes off of him and smiled whenever he looked her way. Because he's like, oh, Mm-hmm. Harry Potter, is that you? Eventually, though, he came over to talk to her. And he was a 23-year-old Italian student, and he actually spoke okay English. I mean, it's pretty broken, but mm-hmm. it's enough to communicate. Yeah. 
And just overall, he seemed really shy. But she was completely charmed by him. Yeah, and I think the whole idea of him just going over to Italy, meeting this guy, looks like Harry Potter. Yeah. He's genuine, kind, cute. Yeah. He's the her Italian Harry Potter of her dreams. I mean, what are the chances that she meets somebody like that? I mean, she probably thought that was like crazy that here's this mm -hmm. perfect guy that mm -hmm. her she dream found. dude. Yeah. So after the concert, Raffaele took her to a romantic spot in the city, and she could tell he was very nervous. But when he kissed her, she was all in. And then they went back to his apartment that night and spent the night together. Spicy. Amanda had never been in love before, but thought this had to be it. And for the next week, they spent every second they could together. During the day, he would take her to his favorite spots in the city, and he'd buy her perfume so she could be like a real Italian lady. Apparently, wow. that's a big deal in Italy. And then at night, they would go back to his apartment, hang out, smoke a little weed, and then watch some movies. And Amanda spent almost every night with him. On Halloween, Amanda ran into Meredith at their apartment, and they talked about their plans. It was Meredith's favorite holiday, and she planned to dress up like a vampire. She even had some fake blood to drip down her chin. Meredith said that she'd been out pretty late with friends, and Amanda said she'd be with Raffaele anyway. The next day, November 1st, was All Saints Day, which is an official national holiday in Italy. So their Italian roommates were all out of town. They saw each other when Meredith woke up late in the day and talked about how their nights had gone. Meredith said she was hanging out with some British friends that afternoon and wouldn't be home until later that night. Amanda said she was heading to Raffaele's and then she was scheduled to work a late shift at the bar. They both left the apartment around 4.30 p.m. and around 8.15 that night, Patrick texted Amanda and told her she didn't have to come to work. So she was super pumped because she's like, mm -hmm. okay, I don't have to work tonight and I get to just hang out with Raffaele. And he texted him back saying, see you later. And then she turned off her phone. Before we continue with the story, though, we want to take a quick ad break. We'll be right back. So I know we all have probably at least one issue with our hair. Something, even if you have the most beautiful hair in the world, maybe it gets too greasy. Maybe it's a little on the dry side. And that's why you need some personalized hair care because it really changes the game. And Function of Beauty is the world leader in customizable beauty, offering precise formulations for your hair's specific needs. And here's how to get started. All you got to do is take a quick but thorough quiz, tell them a little bit about your hair type and your hair goals, such as lengthening, volumizing, and oil control. And because your hair changes with a season, you can change your goals before every shipment. So if you notice you're a little on the dry side, maybe add a little moisture for the month. And you can choose your color and fragrance, which is really cool. Or you can even go fragrance and dye free. So there's an option for everybody. Then Function's team determines the perfect blend of ingredients, bottles your formula, and delivers it right to your door. And every ingredient that they use is vegan, cruelty-free, and they never use sulfates or parabens, which is awesome. And you can also go completely silicone-free. Never buy off the shelf just to be disappointed ever again. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash milehire to take your quiz and save 20% on your first order. It's great for men as well. That's true, babe. You love it. You yeah, have I a new bottle. Yeah, I made my own formulation. Yeah, no, it's, they're cute. They sit together. It's like function of Kendall, function of Josh. So good. Works great. So that's 20% off your first order. That applies to their full range of customized hair, skin, and body products. Just go to functionofbeauty.com slash mile higher to let them know that we sent you and you get 20% off your order. Functionofbeauty.com slash mile higher. One of the things that I absolutely can't live without is my Raycon wireless earbuds. I thought you were going to say me. Well, you are the other thing that I can't live without. <laughs> Thanks. But I must have my Raycon wireless earbuds because... Whenever I go to the gym, if I do not have them, it is a very sad day for me. And I'll even leave the gym and drive home in order to get them and have them while I work out. And when I'm not working out, I also use my Raycon earbuds to listen to music as I fall asleep because Kendall likes to have the TV on at night <laughs> and that just keeps me up even later. And so that's when those earbuds come in clutch. So whether you're catching up on your favorite news podcast, you're binging an audiobook, or powering through your workout with a pumped up playlist. A pair of Raycons in your ears can make all the difference. Best of all, there's no dangling wires or stems to get in your way. Raycons come in a range of stylish colorways and they have, they're have they super comfortable. I gotta say, they do fit inside the ear very well. They have different uh, size little pads for your ears depending on the size, which is great. And it's got a very discreet look, which what a lot of people like. Raycons are built to perform anywhere and anytime with water and sweat resistant construction and the Bluetooth 
technology that pairs quickly and seamlessly. Also, it has enough battery life for six hours of playtime. Best of all, Raycon makes great sound accessible to everyone, with wireless earbuds starting at half the price of other premium audio brands, which is huge because there's a lot of very expensive earbuds out there, so you don't need to pay for those. Raycons have got you covered and the quality of sound you're looking for. And right now, Raycon's offering 15% off all their products for our listeners, and here's what you got to do to get it. Go to buyraycon.com slash milehire, and that's it. You'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order, so feel free to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash milehire. Again, that's buyraycon.com slash milehire today. So you guys know that here at the show, we are all big fans of Native for real. All of us buy Native on the reg. All I of always us. have their their toothpaste, their body washes, everything. It's good. It's really good. And let me tell you why. Native deodorant is formulated without aluminum, parabens, or talc, and is also vegan and never tests on animals. And Native deodorant is made with ingredients that you've heard of, like coconut oil and shea butter. You wear your deodorant every day, so shouldn't you be able to understand the ingredient list? And they have amazing scents. They have tons of different options with rotating seasonals and classics. You're guaranteed to find one you love. And that's one of my favorite things about Native is their scents. They smell so good. Every product I've ever tried from them smells incredible. Things like coconut vanilla, which is the most popular, lavender rose, cucumber mint. And now they have a plastic free option. So if you want to, you know, lower your plastic consumption, it's a great option. And there's no risk to try Native because they offer free shipping on every order in the U.S. And they offer a 30 day free returns and exchange period in the United States. So make the switch to Native today by going to nativedo.com slash milehire20 or use the promo code milehire20 at checkout and you'll get 20% off your first order. That's nativedo.com slash milehire20 or use the promo code milehire20 at checkout for 20% off your first order. So on this night, Amanda spent the night over at Raffaele's apartment because that's pretty much their normal routine. You know, they would smoke, watch movies, just hang out and have sex pretty much, a little Netflix and chill. She literally talks about how they were just hanging out, goofing around, making funny faces at each other that evening. The next morning, Raffaele's water wasn't working, so Amanda went home to take a shower at her flat around 10.30 a.m., and her apartment was just a five-minute walk down the street from his place, and when she got home, she noticed that her door was open, which was unusual, but she didn't think much of it. Sometimes her roommates left the apartment open, the door open, when they ran out to the store, so it wasn't a big deal. When she first walked in, the common area looked normal, and so did her bedroom. So she got undressed and went into the bathroom as usual. But then when she was at the sink, she noticed that there were tiny spots of blood on the faucet. But she thought this was, you know, from another roommate or her recently pierced ears. So she brushed her teeth and took a shower. But when she stepped out of the shower, she noticed that there was this bloody stain. It kind of looks like a footprint. Yeah. On the bath mat. And she wondered if this could be one of her roommates. Maybe they cut themselves shaving or were on their period. So didn't think too, too much of it. So she started drying off, blow drying her hair and getting ready. But then she noticed there were feces in the toilet. And there's actually a picture. Oh, disgusting. That would that would probably. And she said that this is kind of what scared her. Yeah, kind of like that's jolted what, her like, yeah. wait a minute. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't just leave this unflushed like yeah. this. Who, who did this? Because this is very very weird Mm -hmm. she knew meredith wouldn't have done this and one time she had gently reminded amanda to use the scrub brush in the toilet if anything was left behind after flushing so she knew that positively meredith did not leave that there. no absolutely not so now she really had the creeps and she thought someone might be in the apartment right now so she called raffaele to come over so he came right over started looking around the apartment and he said that he thought it was weird that she showered and before getting nervous or getting anxiety, as he said, which I think he basically means he thought she, it's weird that she didn't notice something was more off when she first got there. Yeah. And I, I kind of agree with that a little bit because mm-hmm. I just feel like, I mean, this is not that big of a, a area of space. I mean, obviously you have roommates and stuff, so you're not going to just like wander into your roommate's room and kind of like prowl around mm-hmm. and when you come home. But I do find it a little weird that she just instantly thought that the blood and there was just, you know, not that big of a deal. It was just like, oh, I might have cut someone I might guess. Have cut because like, 
how often does somebody smear blood on a, a mat like that? That's that- true. But at the same time, it's different when you live with a bunch of girls. Like we all shave our legs. We do have periods. Like I wouldn't necessarily first think I probably would have thought someone cut their leg in the shower and yeah, stepped same. out on the bath mat. So I don't know. But just like that wouldn't cause you know, you know, to raise an eyebrow and be like, hmm, I wonder if if somebody you know, like maybe I should check on my roommate or check on well it's easier to say that in hindsight when you know everything that we know but like maybe she just thought it was a normal day true Mm -hmm. and when you're you know you're coming home from a late night you're groggy Mm -hmm. you just want to take a shower Mm -hmm. so when he got there they started looking in the other rooms the window in one of the bedrooms was actually smashed which scared them and it was smashed with a rock from the garden that was on the floor of the bedroom uh cause for concern right there Yeah, definitely so they started freaking out And then they realized that Meredith's door was locked and they knocked, knocked, and there was no answer. They kept knocking louder, calling her name, still got nothing. Very concerning. So at that point, Amanda tells Raffaele to break the door down and he tried a few times according to them, but it didn't open. What? Come on, dude. (laughs) Maybe they're strong there. It's easy to break down a door. Really? Have you broken down a door? Hell yeah. (laughs) When? Hell yeah, it's easy. You just kick <laughs> kick right at the lock. Hell you kick yeah. right there and you just bust it out of the thing. It's easy, guys. Remember we got locked out of our me. we got locked out of our apartment and I oh, nearly yeah, broke did. our door down to get back in, but eventually I was able to get like a little do the yeah, credit card you trick. You weren't to, able to break it down though, were you? No, I could have. <laughs> He's but, been standing out there for thirty minutes. <laughs> you just kicking really it. But I was like, fuck, I'm gonna buy a new door for this apartment <laughs> if I break it down. But well, it's not that hard. I find that very weird and suspicious. I would have just So maybe they didn't even kick this. I mean, this is all their retelling of things. So maybe they didn't kick the door. We don't know. So she was getting really scared at this point, especially that no one's answering. Someone's clearly in the room if it's locked, unless someone went out the window. Um, But she didn't call the police yet. She called her mom in Seattle, which is like a reflex because she was upset and scared and just felt like she needed to talk to her mom, according to her. Okay. So it was in the middle of the night in Seattle, but Etta had told her daughter that she could call her anytime, day or night. So when she answered, she could tell right away that something was wrong. She listened to Amanda's story and she told her to call the police. So Raffaele ended up calling after that and reported a possible break in. And the call is kind of weird. He basically was like, hey, so listen, we have like this door that's closed. He like wasn't very specific and didn't tell a lot of the detail. But honestly, that could be just like a cultural thing. I think you have to remember that in Italy, Mm -hmm. like in just in other countries, they, they deal with crime way differently. Their police is set up a little differently. They have the Italian military police and then they have the postal police, which handles more casual things. So yeah. at first they showed up. They and, investigate like mail fraud yeah. and other crimes related to communications, like very mild crime. And they were actually responding to a call from a woman who had found two cell phones in her garden that morning. And they traced the phones back to that address. They were both Meredith's phones. Hmm. Amanda called her other roommates and told them what was going on. So they showed up to the scene with a few friends. Officers let them go back into the house, look around, which obviously contaminated this crime scene. And this is all before opening Meredith's door, Mm -hmm. mind you. So they're not even taking into account that there could be somebody lying behind this door yeah. and we're just letting people run around a potential crime scene well they refused to break it down because they thought that it would violate her privacy which uh, is kind of interesting yeah okay so one of the roommates boyfriends waited until they stepped away and then just broke it down on their own but once they did they were shocked because they found a horrific crime scene there was blood everywhere on the walls the floor the bed and then they found meredith under a blood-soaked comforter. All they could see at first was one of her feet sticking out. At this point, Amanda is outside with Raffaele. There's a famous clip of her standing outside with him, kissing him, and people have been very critical about the way that she was acting, but she didn't know at that point what had happened. An officer went outside and told her that there was blood everywhere and that Meredith's throat was slit, and that's how she found out that her roommate was dead in that moment. So Amanda called her mom again and said that they found Meredith's body and that the police wanted to question her. And Etta said she could tell her daughter was panicked. But the people around her, police officers and her other roommates, didn't think that she looked panicked. They were surprised, actually, with how calm she seemed. Which, I mean, I think 
we all like to to say that oh you know people should react this way when you yeah. hear such horrific news that your roommate would just was murdered mm-hmm. so i but at the same time it's like everybody you know everybody would deal with that type of news differently mm-hmm. and you can't really judge you know guilt based on that or involvement in a crime based on how somebody reacts to it but in italy they you know i don't want to say they're more emotional when it comes to investigating but they they definitely look at like took that as a factor mm-hmm. into mm-hmm. their they investigation did. of well they're you know everybody else here is absolutely devastated by this horrific crime scene and meredith was just mm-hmm. murdered but yet these two over here being lovey-dovey not not crying mm-hmm. not upset just kind of you know hanging out so to speak so by this time the military police arrived on the scene and the investigators were going in and out of the house for hours meredith was found mostly nude she had been stabbed and had a shockingly deep wound in her neck she also had a series of smaller cuts on her chin maybe from being taunted or tortured even there were signs of sexual assault and that she had been violently held down during the attack according to her autopsy report it said she was stabbed 47 times now i mean just based on the crime scene photos there's tons and tons of blood there's blood absolutely everywhere so that 47 times makes sense and that's, i mean that's just oh that's just so horrific i mean it's really hard to even wrap your head yeah. around you know that happening to anyone mm-hmm. And the officers agreed that this was the work of some type of monster. So the investigation into Meredith's murder was actually led by a controversial Italian prosecutor named Giuliano Magnini. And he was accused of abuse of office while working on the infamous Monster of Florence case, where 16 people were murdered between 1968 and 1985. In 2001, actually, he linked a random suicide to the case and charged 20 people for covering up the death believing the victim and those charged were part of a satanic sect that murdered women and used their body parts in satanic rituals. There was no evidence of any of this, however, and the judge actually threw out the case. So now Giuliano wanted to prove himself, and this murder gave him another chance to catch a monster. So when he arrived, he noticed two young people outside, and those people were Amanda and Raffaele. Who were still kissing, hugging, yeah, all just that, like even after they found out. Which I mean, I think most people would be like, oh, "That's kind of inappropriate for the situation at hand." But yeah, it's weird because it doesn't really look like much like comforting. It looks more just like they're off in their own. Or, yes. I don't know. It's it is odd, but yeah, how much can you judge initial reactions? Yeah. yeah, but it was enough to make him immediately suspicious of them. And as they removed Meredith's body, journalists surrounded the area all trying to get a shot of the body bag, which is just, oh, so, so crazy. Sad. Yeah, they were literally screaming at journalists, like, back up. Have some have dignity. Have some dignity, like, yeah. God. Fucking hell, man. That's so sad. And that's when the story just absolutely exploded. It did. And it made headlines around the world. And the police were now under immense pressure to solve this case quickly. And they wanted to prove that they could handle this type of murder investigation. So they were all working around the clock, interviewing everyone who knew Meredith in order to find a motive. Giuliano believed the break-in was staged, though, because the window was broken and things were thrown around, but nothing was missing. So he believed the killer must have had a connection to the house, and this was the only reason to stage a break-in. The two Italian roommates also had alibi, so that just left Amanda. Giuliano also reasoned that only a woman would cover up the victim with a blanket, he said a man would never think to do this because again what? she was nude that's so odd it makes no sense that reasoning like <laughs> no. what no what does that even mean very weird yeah so he actually believed there were likely multiple killers because meredith was strong enough to fight off one person so he all of a sudden had this theory that he presented that this was a sex game gone wrong which this just seems like a very like male mm like very out there too yeah it's like this what? weird like I, I don't even know like fantasy that a male would create like a sex game like that just seems like such a bizarre theory to throw out there immediately like mm-hmm. go directly to a this was a sex so game fast. gone wrong yeah as opposed to possibly somebody broke in and murdered her for some other reason and obviously she was sexually assaulted so I feel like from your experience, you would go that way as opposed to coming like 
go to the sex game gone wrong theory. It's just kind yeah. of very weird to me, at least, that he went yeah. that way. And then a reporter got that scoop from him. And he's a British writer who's very controversial. He works for the Daily Mail. Fuck this guy. Seriously. Yeah, Nick I agree. Pisa. Nick Pisa. Piece of shit. Yeah. Um, but yeah. after this story, he was a household name. And he was pretty pleased with himself. So he talks all about in the Netflix documentary with no shame how he was like, it was great for me because I could make yeah. these bomb ass headlines like Foxy Noxy, evil sex game, orgy. And he started pumping this shit out and people were just like hooked to the drama right, of it. Right. And it really messed up the, the overall details. This, yeah, definitely. Big time. And he really got like the inside scoop. I mean, he was already friendly with the Italian police who seemed very impressed by him. I mean, he's this British journalist yeah. and I don't know, there's something with British <laughs> journalists there in Italy. They like think very highly of them. So he got the inside information first as a crowd of journalists gathered outside the mortuary for the autopsy results. Nick was invited inside for a private briefing. That's crazy. Tabloid reporters were also sent to Seattle in order to find out more about Amanda. Anonymous friends allegedly described her as a party girl who did drugs and would sleep around and reporters actually combed through her Facebook page and MySpace account. They pulled photos and comments out of context and then printed them with salacious headlines. They even put the video of Amanda and Raffaele kissing mm -hmm. out there to the public. Yep. Which, I mean, obviously is not going to look good. And people are going to, you know, be immediately suspicious by that behavior. They even reported on the pink rabbit-shaped vibrator that she had brought to Italy. They used the headline, Dead Girl Feared Knox's Sex Toys. Dead girl? Does it get much more salacious than that? I mean, that's, that's so brutal. crazy. And it's interesting because Amanda tells a very different version of how she was before she went to Italy, that she was unexperienced and yeah, she's like, like, going to break out of her shell in Italy and was finally being like that, which who knows? I mean, we'll never really know. But... Amanda's every move was now being scrutinized by everyone. Yeah. Officers claimed she was doing cartwheels in the police station, as a, in, which was a sign of joy. Amanda later said she was doing yoga, actually, to calm herself, which I could totally see the police being like, if she was doing yoga, mm -hmm. which I mean. Yeah, it's a little Jody Arias, like, makes you think, but. A little bit. I don't know. Maybe you, you wouldn't need, I mean, I'm sure she was panicking. If you're in a stressful situation, I mean, she said she was dealing with panic attacks and stuff. Like, yeah. I guess you got to do anything to calm yourself down, so. But Meredith's friends thought that Amanda was acting strange. And one friend even said that she hoped Meredith didn't suffer. And Amanda responded to her and said, of course she fucking suffered. She had her throat fucking cut. And she thought this language was inappropriate and harsh. Which I agree. Yeah. I mean, why would you? Yeah, it's pretty cold. Why would you say something like that? Uh, it's pretty weird. So she was portrayed as cold and calculated. One article said that her eyes gave away her guilt. That they were too icy blue to be innocent. Okay, so now we're determining guilt based on your eyes. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty wild. And Nick piece of shit printed all of this without fact checking and making sure what he was saying was true. He would just get information and print it. He always wanted to have the next big scoop, be ahead of other journalists, and get every shocking detail, which does not help at all. No, especially for the investigation. Yeah, I mean, it really it's going to really mess things up mm -hmm. meanwhile police are working on trying to put together a timeline of how everything had gone right so meredith had spent the evening of november 1st with friends she walked home with a friend who lived just a five minute walk from her house they said good night and meredith walked the rest of the way home alone and got there just before 9 p.m the day her body was discovered amanda and raffaele were questioned they both said that they were at Raffaele's apartment that night and a friend had stopped by around 545 and again at 840 and Raffaele talked to his dad around 840 p.m. as well. And then they finished watching a movie on his computer that ended at 910. And this was all verified by the police. Raffaele's place was a short walk from Amanda's and police believed Meredith was killed around 11 p.m. when a neighbor reported hearing a prolonged woman's scream that quote made her skin crawl. Juliano wanted to know what they were doing from 9, 10 to after 11. And Amanda was actually kept in an interrogation room for six hours straight. And during the first hour, she had to answer questions in Italian. She could speak the language, but was far from fluent. And after that, they finally brought in somebody to help interpret. According to Amanda, her and Raffaele were at the apartment all night. 
They were just watching her favorite movie. And then she read to him from a German Harry Potter book. They then hung out in bed, goofing around, making funny faces at each other, which then led to having sex. And then afterwards, they went right to sleep. And at this point, she actually had left out that she had smoked any weed. She didn't know anything else. And neither did Raffaele. And after being questioned, she sat in a waiting room with the other witnesses until 5.30 a.m. the next morning. So this is just like grueling hours of interrogation nonstop. But finally, her and Raffaele were allowed to leave. But they were told to come back at 11 a.m. Later that morning, Giuliano brought Amanda to the house to look for the murder weapon. He made her go through the knife drawer in the kitchen to see if anything was missing. I'm like, keep in mind, she'd barely been there for that long. Like, could you, have you ever stayed at an Airbnb? Like, do you know every single knife that's in a drawer? <laughs> it's a little intense. Right. It's, it's also weird that the police would bring in a potential person of interest into the crime scene to help them locate the murder yeah, weapon that's beyond what weird. kind of pro- that would never fly in the u.s Mm-mm. that's just that's how you're going to contaminate it like mm-hmm. it makes no sense but as he was making her do all of this she actually had a panic attack because everything just kind of hit her all at once and she became hysterical and hit the palms of her hands against her ears giuliano thought she was remembering a sound and trying to block it out like meredith's scream So now he was really suspicious of her and she's just having a panic attack because, I mean, that's a pretty scary situation to be in. I mean, you got this Mm. scary police guy like telling you to find the murder weapon and yeah, just being in a crime scene is creepy as fuck. Seriously. Maybe she was having a flashback. Maybe he was right. That's true. Play devil's advocate here. That's very true. Maybe that maybe she was. I don't know. So after that, they go back to the police station and he asked her to repeat all her answers from the day before so they could type them up. She was with the police for five and a half hours before they finally let her go. At this point, Giuliano was convinced she was guilty and had Amanda and Raffaele's phones wiretapped. Amanda talked to a friend and told her how nervous she was at the police station. And on a call with her mom, she said she wanted to stay to help find Meredith's killer. Her and Meredith had only been friends for a few weeks, but she was shocked by what had happened to her. And she knew if she was home that night, it could have been her that ended up dead. On November 5th, Amanda and Raffaele both went to class as usual, and they actually skipped a candlelight vigil for Meredith later that night. That's weird. But I get it. At the same time, there's like tabloids running. Right. So she already knows that like the police are after her. Mm -hmm. And just people in general don't like her. Yeah. But at the same time, it probably would have been better for her to go to that for her image, at least. Yeah. If your image is under attack to Mm -hmm. show up to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So around 10.30 that night, Giuliano asked Raffaele to come back to the police station. And he was, he was suspicious that Amanda came with him, like she was there to control him. And in the waiting room, she was doing stretches again. And an officer actually yelled at her for the inappropriate behavior. Mm-hmm. And this time, the questioning was very aggressive. Giuliano told Raffaele Amanda was a liar, a stupid slut, and a cow. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. He said she didn't care about him and screamed at him to stop covering for her. Giuliano told him he was in big trouble because they knew the truth about what had happened to Meredith. And Raffaele later explained that after being questioned like that for hours, he started to lose sight of reality. And this is a really big point of contention, I think, in just any type of of case where there's police interrogation that just completely crosses the line. Because people give false confessions all the time and and if you can imagine being in this type of situation where you're being literally yelled at by somebody who's telling you, you did this, you did this, yeah. admit it, admit it. Like how long before you break? Mm-hmm. I think everybody's got a breaking point. So eventually Raffaele changed his story and said Amanda didn't come to his house until 1 a.m. He even signed a statement and Giuliano was satisfied. He had proof that Raffaele lied because Amanda told him to. He then brought Amanda in next and told her that Raffaele had turned on her and they knew she wasn't really with him when Meredith was killed. And by now it was the middle of the night and Amanda was super tired and upset and she insisted that it wasn't true. She said she had to work but her shift was canceled Mm -hmm. and that she was just at Raffaele's place all night. And he asked to see her phone and she just handed it over willingly thinking that it was going to prove that she told the truth. But he ended up finding this text to Patrick, the owner of the bar, 
And in Italian, Amanda had written her last response to him. And it said, we will see each other later. Have a good night. Which meant, in her mind, we'll see each other later on. Like, next time I'll see you. See you when I see you type thing. Because I'm not coming in for work. But he took this as, I will see you later tonight. Right. As in making plans. Right. Doesn't mean and like. he thought it further incriminated her. In, it, in Italian, it's not like this undetermined time mm-hmm. period like we use here. We're like, we'll see you later. And that could be tomorrow. Yeah, maybe. Three she, hours from now. Right. But in, in Italy, that means I'll see you later. Tonight. Tonight. Like mm-hmm. we have an appointment later mm-hmm. together. Yeah. But like I said, he used this against her. He said that this proved that she was with Patrick the night that Meredith was murdered and that she must have watched Patrick kill her and then blacked out the memory because it was so traumatic. So he's really just getting this like completely out of nowhere. Amanda was confused. She thought that maybe she was repressing something. Officers yelled at her and actually hit her twice on the back of the head and screamed, remember, like this would shake the memory loose. (laughs) Isn't that wild? Yeah. I mean, it would be so intense to be interrogated and scary in in a foreign country like that. Mm -hmm. So she said, I don't know what the fuck is going on. And then another officer screamed back at her. Fuck. I understand. Fuck. Fuck you. (laughs) So really just crazy. Yeah. So much was being lost in translation and she just didn't know what to say anymore. They told her that she could be on their side or the murderer's side. And if she couldn't remember, she was going to prison for 30 years for protecting the killer. Which they were is, trying to yeah. just scare something yeah, out of her. Which is not ethical at all. So like Raffaele, she broke as well. She was delirious and had a vision of standing in front of her apartment. The door opened and Patrick was there in his brown leather jacket. Meredith was screaming inside. Amanda covered her ears to block out the screams. She thought that this vision meant that she was remembering something specific, that this must be what it's like to have recovered a memory. When she said, and so she said Patrick's name out loud. And when she did, she started sobbing and thought that it must have meant it was true. Maybe she really was experiencing a memory versus just creating a vision. Yeah, and actually witnessed the murder and just was so traumatized that she couldn't remember, which which is possible, I believe. I mean, that type of thing could happen. Yeah, and maybe you really would have a thought after you're so delirious like that. Yeah. That, oh, wait, maybe, maybe I am blocking this out. You hear of people blocking things out. Yeah. So now Giuliano has three murder suspects because just like Raffaele, she signed a statement as well. And that day, November 6, 2007, Amanda, Raffaele, and Patrick were all arrested. So as soon as Amanda was quietly sitting in jail, she started to question what she had told the police. You know, at that point, she just wanted it to end so bad. She started to think like, God, did I just tell them anything? Um, So she started to tell an officer that she was pretty sure that she had just confessed to witnessing a murder that she knew nothing about. And she said she was bullied and threatened into it and was not thinking clearly. The next morning, she fully retracted her statement. Now she said she was sure that what she confessed wasn't true. She knew that Patrick did not kill Meredith. But it was too late. The wheels were already in motion. And Giuliano was satisfied with his theory and that he thought it was proven that Amanda, with Raffaele and Patrick's help, murdered Meredith because she refused to participate in this violent sex game. He also thought that Amanda was in total control of Raffaele, that he was her puppet and would do anything that she asked, even kill. It's just like sounds like this weird like story he's made like this almost like fantasy in his head he's mm-hmm. created like of like this perfect storm of of you know the situation that he just thought up randomly mm-hmm. in his head and like it made sense to him and now he's got all the pieces to the puzzle for mm-hmm. it to work out and he's like oh Done. Yeah, he's being very blindsided yeah, about it. Yeah, he's just focused on one one angle. So he announces a press conference. And then at the press conference, he announced that they believed that they actually solved the case. And the press had put, you know, immense pressure on the police to solve it quickly. And that's just what he did. So he was feeling pretty good about himself. You know, case closed. Which this is like, clearly this is about ego for him. This is yeah. about him and, you know, him looking like the mm-hmm. hero here. Mm-hmm. Unlike in America and in the UK, suspects in Italy could be held up to a year without being charged with anything, which I never knew that. That's wild. Isn't it? 
So they were being held on suspicion of conspiracy to commit manslaughter and sexual violence, but they were not formally charged until October 2008. Wow. Amanda's mom came out to Italy to visit her while she was in jail. And when Amanda saw her, she cried and said that she did not know who killed Meredith. She was upset that Raffaele had lied about being with her. But Edda reminded her that he was in the same position as her, that he was questioned for hours, scared, tired, confused, and that the police were probably hitting him just the way that they had hit her and threatening him. So this was the perfect recipe for a false confession. Edda told her that this story had become a huge international story, which was news yeah. to Amanda. She had yeah. no idea that this was making headlines all around the world or what you know, the media was saying about her case that they were calling her Foxy Noxy, like how bad they were talking about voodoo rituals and sex games She's and going orgies. going crazy with it with no evidence mm -hmm. of any of this. Yeah, she was like, Amanda, this is this has reached the US. Like we have journalists stalking our family members and harassing them for more information. And she was shocked. And these journalists would just literally go and pull random photographs mm -hmm. of, of Amanda mm -hmm. that they found from her social media pages. And then just put some wild like title with on it, it and, like yeah in order to sell death. papers and she's like she was at a museum in germany in this picture and she's holding a machine gun and kind of laughing and they that's put like an that, old machine gun she's like posing yeah, with it it's right. weird and but, then they put that headline there like she's some crazy yeah. deranged you know mad woman that that committed this crime and then there's also a picture that went around of raffaelli dressed up as a mummy for probably halloween or something and he's holding a meat cleaver and a bottle of bleach so the message was clear that these two were sadistic murderers. Sure. If that's, if that's what you make of their pictures and they're clearly just posing. That, well, that's the message they were trying to put across the media. Yeah. Yeah. So despite the nonstop coverage about Amanda's guilt, her family never questioned her innocence and they believed her from day one. Her mom told a journalist that Amanda didn't know how to lie, that she was the kind of person who would tell you she hated your shoes or your haircut instead of being nice and polite about it. She was really upfront. So she said there was no way that her daughter was capable of hiding her true personality from everyone close to her. And in the documentary that Amanda recently did with Netflix, she's interviewed and she says that either I am the most terrifying, manipulative monster anyone could imagine, or she was falsely accused. If she was falsely accused, that could mean that this could happen to any of us. Yeah. Which is a scary thought. Just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it happens way more than you want to believe. So poor Patrick Lumumba, who's just been brought into this with this random vision and the text message was quickly cleared because he was able to provide an alibi, a clear alibi for the night that Meredith was murdered. Yeah, but not after having your face blasted all over yeah. the news. Yeah, I mean, not and, as quick as it should have been. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he still like mm -hmm. deals with that. Yeah, he no, it fucked his life up for sure. So Giuliano confronts Amanda about why she lied to him, according to him. She said that she was stressed and scared and that he kept telling her that she had seen Patrick that night. He convinced her that he was involved. Yeah. But he dismissed this explanation. He said the only reason that she would lie was to throw off the investigation. Right. Because again, this is all coming back to ego for this guy. He's mm -hmm. getting proven wrong because he's making assumptions about people yeah. that he doesn't have any evidence to back up. And now... It's backfiring on him. And yeah. so he's trying to, he's just trying to cover his tracks. He said that she had an attitude problem, that she was very hostile, rebellious, and like an anarchist. Basically how many young Americans would react to being accused of lying. And at this point, Giuliano believed the murder weapon was hiding in Raffaele's apartment. So on November 15th, he got a search warrant. And when they got in there, there was a lot of knives there because Raffaele actually collected them. And in the kitchen, they found a knife that could have been used to cut Meredith's throat. And when they did a DNA test on it, Amanda's DNA was found on the handle. And at first, Meredith's was found on the blade, which this was huge because it connected Amanda and Raffaele to the murder. But Giuliano was sure she was killed by three people. And then later that month, the police were able to identify a third suspect who was 20-year-old Rudy Guade. Rudy was a petty criminal and a small time drug dealer, and he also had a history of breaking into homes and using a knife as a weapon. And what directly linked him to the crime scene was that his DNA was all over the place. They found fingerprints, bloody footprints, and a bloody handprint on a pillow in Meredith's room, which all came back to him. He also was the one that left the feces in the toilet. 
and his DNA was identified on the vaginal swabs from Meredith. So clearly yep. he's involved. Yep. And so the police issued a warrant for his arrest and they discovered that he had actually fled to Germany the day after the murder. So obvious. Right? Rudy was a drifter from West Africa and he was actually raised in Italy. And by his late teens, he was on his own dealing drugs in order to make money. He had rented a flat in Perugia in the summer of 2007 and was friendly with all the four male students who lived in that apartment below Meredith and Amanda. So there you go. There it gives them reason to know that they live there and live there alone. And this guy was linked to three other break-ins the month before Meredith was killed. Right. So the police got one of his friends in order to call him in Germany on Skype and ask him about the murder. And Rudy told his friend that he met Meredith on Halloween. And the next day he went to her house and they were planning to hook up, but he didn't have a condom. So he used the bathroom and heard Meredith screaming. And he said when he came out of the bathroom, there was a man that was running out of the door to the flat and her throat was slashed. She's bleeding and she was clinging to him as she was dying. Yeah, he, he said she was like hanging on to him, which right. scared him. And he knew that he was going to be covered in blood. Right. And meanwhile, this guy's running out the apartment, but it's so dark. He can't see who it is. It's like, hmm. Yeah. Trying to set the scene. And he's, you know, he's scared about getting in trouble because of all this. So he he knew he had to, to flee. And he was so scared that he was even thinking about killing himself. During this Skype conversation, his friend also asked about Amanda and Raffaele. And Rudy said Amanda had nothing to do with it. And he didn't even know who Raffaele was. At this point, an international arrest warrant was issued and Rudy was arrested on November 20th, 2007 and brought back to Italy. Amanda heard about the arrest and she had actually seen Rudy around the basketball court and in the bar, but never even really knew his name. But she had other things to worry about. She was having a very rough time in prison. The senior guard who took her to most of her medical appointments was harassing her. He would call her to an empty office and ask her about her sex life who she had sex with, what she liked, and if she wanted to have sex with him. Things got really stressful when they told her that she was HIV positive and would eventually develop AIDS. Isn't that crazy? They yeah, just told just, her that. Yeah. It wasn't true. Which obviously she was devastated because this meant that she couldn't have a family. And she wrote about it actually in her diary and actually in the diary listed out her sexual partners in order to try to figure out, you know, all the people she had sex with and whether or not she used protection with them. And there was actually seven different men on the list. And some way, somehow, Nick piece of shit caught hold mm -hmm. of the diary and it was leaked to the media. And he, you know, he's asked about this in the documentary. He says the most smug answer and he's mm -hmm. like, journalists don't give up our sources. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. It's our Journalist. journalistic secrets or something. Just, mm -hmm. uh, but the media called it her secret diary and claimed the only reason to list her conquests was to display them like trophies. Article said she was always thinking about sex and always hunting men. They even called her a man eater, a mm. femme fatale. A femme fatale. <laughs> Sinister. Femme fatale. Femme, is that right? Femme I don't fatale? know. Isn't that? I don't know. <laughs> I think that's a Britney Spears song. Femme fatale. Right? I don't think it's pronounced fatal. I don't even know. <laughs> Just move on. But yeah, sinister, seductress, she devil, witch. Yeah, they just made her look like the absolute this, worst. Like, se sexual deviant, which is really interesting because she talks about in the documentary that her time waiting for a trial, she was like considered herself asexual. Or no, this wasn't in the documentary. This was that podcast. What yeah. what show was she on? The guy? Theo Vaughn. Yeah. Yeah very casual so interview yeah. yeah it was kind of strange to ask her about yeah. that but she started talking about just her yeah i don't know i mean they really it really was totally manipulated everything and she says though was that she was not sexually really sexually experienced yeah the way to her yeah. but then again she had seven partners that she wrote down in her diary i don't know i mean but it's like it, it just i mean whatever who cares right? so i but i'm just saying that i can see how people would find that conflicting that this young girl already had seven sexual partners when they told her she had HIV that she was trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I can kind of see why there's some confusion there, which I don't know. I mean, it's not saying that seven sexual partners means you're this sexual seductress and you're all these things that they're mm -hmm. calling her, but it, I do find it conflicting information 
mm-hmm. when she's saying, oh, I was, you know, I'm not this sexual person. I just think it's kind of irrelevant to the conversation overall. And she shouldn't really sure. have to answer any of this because, I mean, her, she, I mean, Rudy's DNA was found all over her body. He raped her clearly. So I don't understand why. Yeah, why are we so focused on who Amanda was having sex with? Right, and it's, it's only like, really because of Nick, piece of shit, and his whole sex game story. Well, you and know? Giuliano's pushing that the most, so right? That and that's his because leading theory. That's him. the only theory he's giving the media is that mm-hmm. this was a sex game gone wrong. And so when they find out from the diary she had seven men, they're like, "Oh, confirmed. She's this." Yeah, from sex- their eyes, right? Yeah. From their eyes, they're yeah. saying this all makes sense now. She's. Mm-hmm. She's not who she says she is. She's really this, you know, super active sexual girl. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. It's <laughs> it gets really, really confusing because it's just sad because it really doesn't have much to do with anything. But no, the only reason it's even coming into play is because of the theory that's been put forth by the prosecutor. Even her own lawyer compared Amanda to Jessica Rabbit. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Her own lawyer on her side. Mm. So weird. So this is kind of interesting. Surveillance video from the day after Meredith's body was found showed Amanda and Raphael shopping for women's underwear. And the store owner said he heard them laughing and talking about having hot sex that night. And the media spun this as proof that she was a sex obsessed psychopath who didn't care about Meredith at all. So we've (laughs) gone shopping for underwear before. Are we sex obsessed psychopaths? That's the like stupidest thing I've on ever Earth. heard, honestly. Yeah, I agree. And what if you are sex obsessed? Like, not saying she was, but what if she was? What does that have to do with? I'm right. still confused. I know. I completely agree. It doesn't. Yeah. And it, I mean, again, they it just comes it back to the theory, but it doesn't prove. No. Even if she was that, it doesn't prove that she had anything to do with Meredith's death. Right. Mm-hmm. There's nothing linking her to the death of Meredith. At Plus, it's point. so obvious of who did it. Other right. than Actually, knife. I guess the knife. So you got to remember the knife is still in play here. Right. It's the DNA on the blade and Amanda's, Amanda's, is on, Amanda's the on the handle. handle. Yeah. So the story still has all this mm-hmm. fuel to it because mm-hmm. of those reasons, because of what's being put forth in the media from the investigators. So then eventually the media discovered her childhood nickname on her MySpace page, Remember that? People would always have little nicknames for themselves on MySpace. You never had your actual display name on there. Amanda had her nickname on MySpace displayed as Foxy Noxy because this was her nickname on the soccer team. And she was quick on the soccer field like a fox. But Nick Piece of Shit said, oh, this is good. Mm -hmm. Perfect name for my next headline. Foxy Noxy on the front page. Yep. He wrote a whole story about Foxy Noxy. And got a ton of, yeah, you know, attention, even more. Honestly, a lot of this case and the reason for it being so salacious and blown out of proportion is because of Nick. Mm-hmm. Fucking Nick. people like Nick. Yeah. So at this point, investigators were still trying to work on gathering evidence in order to build their case more. They actually went back into the apartment to do luminal tests a few weeks after the murder. And these tests revealed bare footprints throughout the apartment that couldn't be seen by the naked eye. And investigators determined that they were made in blood. They also matched the bare footprint on the bath mat to Raffaele's foot. And on December 18, 2007, they were all back at the apartment to collect evidence, including Meredith's bloody clothes. They got a big break in the case when they found Meredith's missing bra clasp, which had been ripped or cut off. And it was actually under a rug in her bedroom, and it had traces of Raffaele's DNA in it. Mm. So very important to understand with this is that they were horrible at not contaminating the crime scene. They Mm -hmm. would not switch their gloves. I don't even think they wore sterile gloves. They would not switch their booties. They'd wear the same booties that they'd go in, Mm -hmm. go into the scene. So it's very, very likely that there is cross contamination of DNA because obviously the other, other people's DNA is there. And they were also looking at other pieces of evidence from other you know, from Raffaele's place. Mm-hmm. So yep. it's very possible that this there's just all sorts place. of cross contamination going yeah. on here. But in Giuliano's eyes, he was certain that the case was now officially closed because he had DNA connecting all three suspects to the murder. Yeah. So he's like, oh, good. We did a good job. So when announcing his new evidence, investigators congratulated him for a job well done. He was pleased with himself. 
So before we get into the trials, we want to quickly take our last sponsor break and we'll be right back. Unhappy with your smile? You don't have to be. Thousands of people have used Candid, the clear, comfortable, removable, and practically invisible aligners to help straighten their teeth. And now they love their smile. And Candid is here to help straighten your teeth so you can fall in love with your smile too. Your treatment is prescribed and closely monitored remotely by a licensed orthodontist who's an expert in tooth movement. And plus, you'll always have the same quality care you'd get from an in-office orthodontist from the comfort and convenience of your own home. And while other companies, they use general dentists, Candid only works with orthodontists. And when you start the process with Candid, they make it super easy for you. They send you the kit in the mail to do your impressions and molds, and then they basically 3D print you up some aligners that fit you just perfectly, which makes the whole process seamless and easy. And again, it can all be done from the comfort of your own home. And with Candid, you get the same orthodontist who created your plan is who you'll have from start to finish. So you'll never have to wonder how you're doing. And the average Candid treatment is just six months and you'll start seeing results way before then. And best of all, it costs thousands of dollars less than traditional braces. So become your best you and start straightening your teeth today. And right now you can save $75 on your Candid starter kit. Go to candidco.com slash milehire and use code milehire. That's candidco.com slash milehire and use code milehire. Take advantage of this limited time offer to save $75 on your starter kit. Again, that's candidco.com slash milehire and make sure you use the code milehire. You guys know that I absolutely love third love bras. They are so, so good. I can't tell you how much I truly love these bras. They're the only bras that I wear. And let me tell you why third love is so awesome. They use measurements for millions of women to design their bras with all day comfort and support. They have this awesome fitting room quiz, which is like a personal shopper for your boobs. It focuses on size, breast shape, current fit issues, and your personal style to deliver bras and underwear that are perfect for you. And during the whole thing, their fit stylists are available one-on-one to chat with you on any questions that you have. It's time to break up with your bad bra and fall in love with better bras and underwear because your boobs deserve it. Third Love is changing the game when it comes to comfort and style for all your everyday essentials, from loungewear and wireless styles to their number one rated 24-7 classic t-shirt bra. And what we love about Third Love is they donate all of their gently used return bras to women in need and support charities in their local San Francisco Bay Area and across the United States. And so far, Third Love has donated a whopping $40 million worth of bras. Third Love knows that your one true fit is out there. So right now they are offering our listeners 20% off your first order. All you got to do is go to thirdlove.com slash mile higher to find your perfect fitting bra and get 20% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash mile higher for 20% off today. The months after Rudy was arrested, he actually changed his story. He now said that he had consensual sex with Meredith. And when he went to the bathroom, that's when he heard her screaming. And when he came out of the bathroom, it was actually Amanda and Raffaele who were murdering her. Interesting detail to leave out before. Hmm. Right? Yeah. It just seems like he's trying to save his own mm-hmm. ass at this point. Absolutely. His lawyer actually opted for a fast track trial. And in Italian law, a defendant can choose to receive a sentence after just a hearing. And because Rudy was giving up some of his rights, he was likely to get a shorter sentence than if he had gone to, through a full trial. So in October of 2008, he was actually sentenced to 30 years. And then he was able to appeal that sentence and it got reduced to just 16 years. That's crazy. Which seems pretty obvious that he was the one who yeah. murdered Meredith and he literally is going to get out. What a fucking shame. Less than 10 years now. Because this is so muddied too. Yeah, and it got so messed up. Mm-hmm. The media covered Rudy's conviction, but no one was really interested in him. Yeah. It was the only Amanda. was like, no, we don't want to know about that guy. Yeah. We don't want him to have been the one. It's much more interesting and juicy if it's right. Amanda. Keep, keep the Amanda the story game. going. Yeah, yeah, people were like addicted to the drama, the soap opera of the whole thing. So on the other hand, Amanda and Raffaele were tried together. The first hearing was on October 18th, 2008, and Giuliano focused most of his argument on Amanda. He said Meredith was murdered as part of a satanic ritual, just as he had claimed in the Monster of Florence case. Isn't that crazy? That's wild. Yeah. That's absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. So here's how it happened in Giuliano's mind. Meredith saw Amanda and Raffaele and Rudy drinking and partying in their apartment, and they wanted her to participate in some sort of sex ritual or sex game. 
and Meredith refused. She'd had enough of Amanda and her lack of morals, and she scolded her for her behavior. Amanda became angry and was humiliated that she started yelling at Meredith and actually physically shoved her. And that's when they started arguing. Then Amanda randomly attacked Meredith, stabbing her. And then Raffaele and Rudy joined in. And they were both just at Amanda's command Mm -hmm. and willing to do anything in order to quench her thirst for murder, it seems. Raffaele held her arms down while Rudy raped her. And all of this was at Amanda's command. So odd. That's just such a wild story to put forth without with very little evidence. So the full trial began on January 16th, 2009, and Amanda and Raffaele had already spent 14 months in jail at this point. So the media reported on this as the trial of the century and repeated phrases like drug fueled sex game over and over again. Yeah, because their ratings are going through the roof. Mm-hmm. They're like, People we can keep hooked. this going as long as we can. That's good for us. And around the world. Yeah. So Giuliano was confident that they'd get a guilty verdict. He had no doubt that both of the defendants were guilty, and he believed that Amanda was the mastermind behind the murder. Amanda had a lot of support, though, from her family and friends, but this had a huge impact on their lives, obviously, especially Amanda's yeah. being in jail. And in Italy, across the world, mm-hmm. when your family's back in Washington. Yeah, and she talks more in her in the podcast that she's been featured on recently. She was on Whitney Cummings' podcast and that guy that you mentioned, what's his Theo name? Vaughn. Yeah, Theo Vaughn. Yeah. Um, she talks more about just what was j- what jail was like. It's pretty interesting to hear. And it was horrible. Mm-hmm. It was horrible. So her father, Kurt, traveled back and forth to Perugia so often that he ended up losing his job. Their family also rented an apartment in Perugia and her stepfather, Chris, stayed in it almost full time. Her sister, Deanna, was in college when Amanda was arrested, but she couldn't focus on school and had to drop out. That's how intense it was. Plus, they were being stalked yeah. back at home. Yeah. Etta and Kurt were charged with defamation for defending their daughter to British newspapers and repeating that she was physically and verbally abused during the interrogation. Yeah, which is what mm-hmm. Amanda told them. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, it seems pretty obvious that that happened. The family spent more than $1 million on Amanda's defense and traveling back and forth to America and Italy. Her parents ended up mortgaging both of their houses. God. Isn't that crazy? And then Amanda has this close friend who I believe she's still close with. She was the reason that she went on Theo Vaughn because her friend likes him. Yeah. Um, But anyway, her name is Madison Paxton, and she testified for Amanda as a character witness. And she saw how difficult things were for Amanda in prison. And after that, she actually decided to transfer to university in Perugia and moved there to help support her friend. That's a good friend. That's right there. a good friend, right? Not a lot of people would do that. Mm-hmm. The trial went on for almost a year and court was only in session a few days a week. And many weeks there were no hearings at all. Oh, Just a lot of sitting man. and waiting. Yeah. They allowed reporters to come into the courtroom. They allowed them in the back and they were always crowded in there fighting over who was going to get the best shot of Amanda. And they printed pictures of her smiling or with her gaze off to the side to make her look shifty. God. Yeah. That's just, that's so horrible, man. I know. The lead forensic investigator testified about the DNA evidence, including the footprints that were made in blood found through the luminal test. And her defense team countered that there was no trace of Amanda's DNA in Meredith's room and that the footprints hadn't been tested for blood other than using luminal, which identified multiple substances, Mm -hmm. not just blood. The prosecution, however, argued that if Rudy had acted alone, he wouldn't have stayed around to stage the break-in. That had to be Amanda, because who knew no one else would be coming home that night? Plus, they argued Meredith wouldn't have let Rudy in, so someone else had to be there to let him in. But the knife and the bra clasp were the real smoking guns. They connected Amanda and Raffaele directly to the murder through DNA evidence. The trial ended on December 4th, 2009, and the jury started deliberations. And it only took one day before they were ready to announce a verdict. Which is crazy for a case like this. One day. Oh my God. So when that announcement came out that there was going to be a verdict, a huge crowd gathered around the courtroom. And on December 5th, 2009, Amanda and Raffaele were both found guilty of faking a break-in, defamation, sexual violence, and murder. Raffaele was sentenced to 25 years and Amanda was sentenced to 26. 
And literally outside, when the verdict was read, they they caught wind. The crowd was cheering. Yeah. Because they thought they had just, you know, put two cold-blooded killers away. I'm very curious from our Italian viewers, which I know we have quite a few Italians that watch the show or listen to the show, just what your opinion is on this or what you think the public, what the opinion of the you know, general Italian population seems to be because it seems like a lot of them think she's guilty. Mm-hmm. Like there I mean, were huge crowds. Yeah, not only that, Meredith's family was yeah. obviously very, very happy about the verdict. Mm-hmm. They felt like justice had been done. But Amanda's friends and family were absolutely devastated and her parents had been so certain that she was going to get cleared that they had brought her three younger sisters to court. And all of that was a really traumatic experience for them. Now, Americans were absolutely outraged by this. One person that spoke up a lot was Donald Trump. He was not happy about this, and he wanted her to be released and for the government to get involved, our government. Well, I think I'm good at judging people, and I study people, and I become rich because I understand what people are about. And I watched the Amanda Knox case unfolding in news reports from people like yourself, and after watching it for a little while, I said, this is not a guilty person. There's no evidence that links her to this crime other than she said some stupid things after, uh, you know, being tormented for hours and hours and hours. I know exactly what this guy is all about. He's a maniac. And I watched this maniac who's being prosecuted for abuse and he won't give anybody, I mean, it wouldn't matter to him if she was innocent or guilty. He just wanted to bring in the scalp. So after this, Amanda was in jail and she saw a trailer for the Lifetime movie, Amanda Knox, Murder on Trial in Italy. And she said that she just felt sick to her stomach after realizing that she had no control over how her story was told. So at this point, Amanda decided for her own mental health, she needed to just stop watching TV or reading newspapers. And she was so depressed at this time, she thought a lot about suicide and said she started planning several ways that she could do it. But eventually she did make friends with the prison's Catholic chaplain, and he helped her come out of her depression. Eventually she realized that she kind of had to reimagine her life in prison now, so she decided to try to make the most of her time. So she spent a lot of time reading, writing letters to her friends, jogging around the prison yard, which she said was just like a concrete box pretty much. And she played guitar as well in the church choir. So she was kind of building a life in there. And she also was studying different languages and became fluent in in Italian, which was one of her goals. On the other hand, Raffaele had a very Mm -hmm. tough time in prison. He had wanted to stay with Amanda, but as soon as this all went down, she broke up with him through a note. And this just absolutely devastated him. Well, can you imagine if they stayed together and wrote notes between each other? Then it would become a whole salacious thing. People would find the notes. Amanda knew she had to like cut it off. Absolutely. But I think he was really like, in love with her like kind of infatuated with her so. would they have stayed together if all of this didn't happen who knows maybe I, don't, it was I don't know real love. yeah maybe anyway but, he spent six months in solitary confinement at one point uh, how depressing that's, that's is that? just that's literal torture man yeah like, it really is talk about lonely i mean that's gonna really take a toll on your mental health and he became yeah. very lonely and depressed mm-hmm. so all the while they're also appealing their you know their the verdict and everything so Under Italian law, defendants get two appeals. The first appeal started in December of 2010. Giuliano also was making appeals. He actually was appealing that their sentences be increased to life in prison. He didn't feel like the 25, 26 year sentence was long enough. However, the defense requested a reexamination of DNA evidence because if if anything's going to get you, you know, off in this type of situation, it's going to be the DNA. So in June 2011, a judge ordered two independent forensic experts to re-examine the knife and the bra clasp for DNA evidence. And these experts were absolutely shocked when they got a hold of the actual, you know, the knife and the bra clasp when they looked at the reports the police had made because they realized that the crime scene had been completely mishandled. Mm -hmm. In multiple videos, they watched people go in and out of the house before forensics even got to the scene, touching crucial surfaces like Meredith's bedroom door. Once forensics got there, the video showed that the scene was far from sterile. People weren't wearing protective suits. They didn't change their booties and rarely changed their gloves. One forensic investigator was on video touching surfaces that had visible blood with their thumb. She didn't change her gloves and then swab the next area, touching that surface with the same thumb. And, stupid. Yeah. 
And then in the bathroom, she swabbed the blood on the faucet, which was found to be Amanda's blood, and then swabbed other surfaces, mixing the samples. Like they just wow. straight up did not know what they were doing with this type of crime scene. Really bad. And when she was collecting these samples, she also used a wiping motion. Instead of being precise and testing a small area at a time, she just go wipe across multiple services with the same swab, which is obviously not protocol at all. She also went from room to room, swabbing the surfaces, still without changing gloves, and some investigators even discarded gloves on the floor. It was just absolutely insane. Three samples from the bathroom showed Amanda's DNA mixed with Meredith's, which was used as proof that Amanda was involved in the crime. But even without the evidence contamination by the investigators, the bathroom was shared by the two women. So, of course, both of their mm. DNA would be found in the bathroom. Prosecutors also said they found footprints of Raffaele and Amanda in Meredith's bedroom. But actually, both of those prints turned out to be Rudy's. Mm. And every bloody shoe print belonged to Rudy, including all the prints in Meredith's bedroom. The tread marks matched a pair of shoes he threw away after the murder. Police found the box for the shoes in his apartment, and he admitted the prints were his. Investigators also scrubbed away the bloody footprints less than 12 hours after the body was found. That's just trash. Yeah. Like, what on earth? Yeah, horrible. And after this cleaning, they did the luminol tests and found the bare footprints they claimed were made in blood. The independent experts found that the bare footprints had been tested with a type of chemical which is extremely sensitive to blood, and the results were negative. The prosecutors knew the footprints weren't made in blood, but ignored this during the trial. A big oopsie. The footprints had also been tested for Meredith's DNA, and all those tests came back negative. Prosecutors had matched the bloody footprint on the bath mat to Raffaele. However, a second look showed that the measurements investigators used were wrong, and it definitely wasn't a match to his foot, but it was a match for Rudy's foot. Prosecutors argued that bloody footprints from Amanda and Raffaele must have been cleaned up then. And to prove this, they had a witness. A store owner claimed he saw Amanda in a store around 7.45 that morning buying cleaning supplies. But surveillance video later showed the store owner didn't arrive that morning until after 7.45 a.m. And the worker in the store knew Amanda personally and said she wasn't there that day. Just straight up lies. Mm -hmm. Prosecutors claimed they found a mix of Amanda and Meredith's DNA in some of the footprints, arguing that even if they weren't made in blood, that was significant. But the independent experts explained that just casually brushing up against something will leave behind traces of DNA. If the investigators had tested the whole floor, they would have found traces of DNA belonging to all the roommates all over the apartment. So they, these in, mm -hmm. Italian police literally had no crime scene investigation skills, it seems like. They kind of kind of knew what to do. That but guy they, in the documentary would be pissed at you. He would be. but That you know, one guy, he was like, what did he say? He's like, oh, Americans always give us so much shit for how our criminal justice system is but we've been doing this for Since 700 years longer than you something and, yeah like yeah. 1308 we've been doing criminal but these law. are i mean damn these are some big mistakes though like is but, this standard though we don't know if this is just that those police this right. department or is i this, would hope it's not the yeah, case for all italian police that they don't yeah. know how to do basic swabbing for dna like yeah this is kind of wild yeah it's really wild and also no control testing was done they only tested the spots where luminol showed print so they had nothing to compare it to and the most crucial pieces of evidence that were re-examined were Meredith's bra clasp and the knife. Raffaele's DNA was found on the clasp, but there were at least two additional samples of unidentified male DNA that were never tested and not even mentioned during the trial. The bra clasp was found under a rug 46 days after the murder. The experts said in that time, DNA could have been brought yeah. in from anywhere in the apartment. Could have. Absolutely. It's not hard to get DNA on stuff. Don't you feel like Giuliano... I mean, he would do something like that, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't put it past him. No. To go plant something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Amanda's DNA was found on the handle of the knife. That's been confirmed. And Meredith's was found on the blade. However, the profile for Amanda was very clear, but the DNA in the blade was such a trace amount that the likelihood of it being just caused by contamination was actually very high. And the experts discovered that the DNA from the knife was tested along with 50 samples of Meredith's DNA. They were convinced it was contaminated and the sample was changed to inconclusive. So it's just, it, there wasn't even probably, enough to yeah. even say. It was clearly from contamination. No, so that knife probably had Amanda's DNA on it because she used it the night before at Raphael's apartment to cook or whatever yeah. or at some point. It's not even there at the scene. And then, it's yeah, like, and, who, and hers probably wasn't even on it. Meredith's probably wasn't even on it. 
And since the knife now had no DNA from the victim, there's no reason to call it the murder weapon. And like you just said, it's just a random knife from Raphael's apartment. Yep. The media reported on the botched investigation and false DNA evidence. Obviously, Americans were very angry and questioned the Italian legal system and how this could have happened. The Italians were then mad at the Americans mm -hmm. for questioning their process. Yeah, and there's still a lot of debate over it to this day. Yeah, there is. Giuliano was annoyed that him and his team were being attacked by the press, and he didn't like that they were just focusing on the DNA evidence when there was plenty of other circumstantial evidence that showed that Amanda was guilty. Sorry, bro. That That's doesn't hold works. up. No. And Giuliano had no doubts about her guilt because she told so many lies and because her behavior was irrational for an innocent person. That's so odd. And at this point, I mean, this is horrible for Meredith's family because they're just like, mm -hmm. like, they just thought that they had all the answers and the truth, and now they're finding out they that... Try to heal, but now they have to reopen it all. Yeah. And Amanda's still getting all the coverage in the news. Mm -hmm. Like, no Meredith one's barely, is being, no one's even talking about Meredith. Yeah, right. They were crushed. Yeah, Meredith's father actually lashed out at the Daily Mail because they had turned Amanda into a celebrity while ignoring his daughter, the murder victim. Mm -hmm. But after closing arguments in the trial, deliberations started, and on October third, two thousand eleven, both defendants were found not guilty of murdering. Meredith Kircher and the court ordered their immediate release. They they actually convicted her to three years imprisonment. And convict Amanda to pay for all charges or fees uh, for the defense for an amount of 22,000 euros and to reimburse all the expenses and acquit the, the defendants of the charges A, B, C and D as the evidence is not, uh, is not reliable and it can sustain the, the actual crime. Thus, thus the court orders the immediate release of Amanda and Raffaele Solecito. Silence, please. Silence. So Amanda was absolutely sobbing as she left the courtroom. She's kind of rushed out. It was a really intense moment. That's the clip I remember seeing on TV everywhere. Her whole family was there and they hugged each other and cried in relief. But meanwhile, outside, there was a crowd of angry Italians chanting shame murderers. People were pissed. Yeah, it was very controversial. Mm -hmm. outcome to this yeah, especially for the people again in Italy. i'm so curious how our italian viewers feel about this and of course there were rumors that raffaele's wealthy family had interfered somehow and that the judge in the case was up for a promotion before the trial but he retired instead amanda and her family left the country but not before getting into a high-speed chase with paparazzi who rammed into the back of their rental car as they raced to the airport what a traumatic experience seriously like for all of them, how crazy. Yeah. So now Amanda was 24 years old and she had to go home to live a normal life after being in jail all those years. So she went back to the University of Washington and actually finished her degree, which is super impressive. And then she landed a book deal and that was a big deal because there was a bidding war between publishers. Yeah. But it was a big deal. It was a nice book deal. She was paid over $3.5 million dollars and was criticized heavily for cashing in. Her book is called Waiting to be Heard and was published in the spring of 2013. But she said in reality, her parents had spent so much money and lost jobs and her family had debts and legal fees. Yeah, so a lot really of all of it went towards that. Which makes sense. I mean, yeah. So Raffaele went home too, and he knew it would be good to be free, but he struggled. He didn't know how to be a normal person anymore, or how to start all over again. Amanda was recognized everywhere that she went, as you can imagine. She was hounded by the media and followed around by paparazzi, even home in Seattle. And she hated it. It made her feel like she still wasn't in control of her own life. And she started taking self-defense classes to try to get become tougher and have more control of her situation. And she said that she felt different. And her friends and family noticed that she was a bit different when she got back from Italy. She used to be this goofball who was making everyone laugh. 
but now she seemed intense and antisocial, and she had been through a lot. Her parents were hounded by the media constantly. Everyone just wanted an interview, you know? What's mm -hmm. it like to be back? What was your time like? Get the, the juicy exclusive with Amanda Knox. But her parents just wanted to focus on her mental health and getting her back into her normal routine. But the nightmare wasn't over yet oh, because no, there wasn't. was a second appeal. And the prosecution argued a whole new motive. It wasn't a sex game gone wrong anymore, but actually an argument that got out of hand. They said that when Meredith complained about an unflushed toilet, Amanda got angry and then things turned violent over a poop left in the toilet. Yeah, with no proof of this. Yeah, okay. Just all of a sudden out of nowhere. And then she convinced Raffaele and Rudy to help her murder Meredith. And the court actually accepted this argument. Wow. And on March 26, 2013, the acquittal was overturned. And a retrial began in Florence on September 30th, 2013. But Amanda and Raffaele weren't present. No, they were both at home. And Amanda watched this whole thing play out on TV. How yeah, crazy is that? I know. I don't know if it was actually on TV, all of it, or if it was just live streamed from the courtroom. But she got to watch it from home. Yeah. Um, she was like, I'm not going back. Yeah. You're going to have to come and get me. Are you kidding? That would feel me so there. scary I having this all dredged either. up again. Yeah. So this time, prosecutors focused on circumstantial evidence instead of DNA evidence and Amanda's odd behavior after the murders and her personal relationships. Yeah, that's going to really work out well. Yeah. So on January 30th, 2014, they were both reconvicted of the murder. It's crazy. And this crazy? time, Amanda was sentenced to 28 and a half years in prison and Raffaele was sentenced to 25. A few months later, the court released their reasoning for this. And the report said that there were multiple injuries on Meredith's chin, which is something that had been talked about for a while. These little like nicks, which is what Nick piece of shit said, kind of gave him the whole idea yeah. about this sex game that maybe someone was kind of torturing like her. Like taunting her. like yeah. yeah. So they basically argued that this was made with a different knife other than the murder weapon and proved that Rudy did not act alone. And because Amanda had mentioned a scream in her confession and a neighbor hearing the scream, this was considered proof that Amanda was present during the murder. Other reasons for her guilt were that she falsely accused Patrick and that the break-in was staged. The court rejected the report from the independent experts that DNA had been contaminated. Which is insane. Isn't that crazy? Doesn't even make any sense at all. The lawyers in this case weren't surprised at all, but the public was shocked by all this. And Amanda told the media that she would not willingly go back to Italy to serve her sentence. Authorities took Raffaele's passport to keep him from fleeing the country. And Meredith's family was lost in the mix of all of this. They spoke about how difficult it was to be pulled back and forth during this long, lengthy legal process. Yeah. I can't imagine what it was like for them. She's guilty. She's not guilty. She's guilty. Like, are you kidding me? What a failure of the system, man. Like, yeah, can't even get it right the first time. So after the second guilty verdict, Amanda was once again in limbo. And so was her family because all of their lives had been really put on hold during this. Mm -hmm. Her mom, who used to love reading, couldn't even focus enough to read anymore. Her father was sad all the time, and her younger sister, Deanna, was more like her big sister now, comforting her and trying to hold the family together. So the case was appealed to Italy's Supreme Court and looked at by a panel of judges. And on March 26, 2015, the day that the verdict was expected, paparazzi crowded outside of the Knox family home. Amanda, there's, they were literally camped out at the yeah. end of their driveway, like watching, and they're inside getting the biggest news of their life. Amanda was up all night watching the live stream of the courtroom with her family and a few close friends. And the thing was that this time, whatever was decided was final. Either Amanda and Raffaele were headed back to jail or they were exonerated. The stakes could not have been higher. Yeah, I mean, it's at the highest court in the land, the Supreme yeah. Court of Italy. I mm. mean, God, how nerve wracking though. Seriously. And the ruling came in at around 6 a.m. Seattle time, which is 3 p.m. in Italy, on March 27th, 2015, and they announced that the guilty verdict was overturned. Amanda and Raffaele were completely exonerated in the murder of Meredith Kircher. This is the final outcome. Yeah, this was it. There's no going back and forth after this. This is It's closed. It's done. And there's a clip of this in the documentary on Netflix of her family screaming and cheering when it was read. And Amanda called Raffaele right away and said, we're free. So that September, the Italian Supreme Court released their reasoning for the decision they blamed the, quote, stunning flaws in the investigation and the increased media attention that created a frantic search for the killer. 
They also said there was a complete lack of any DNA evidence that connected Amanda and Raffaele to the crime. Ironically, Nick Pisa, the Daily Mail writer, blamed the police and the prosecution for being obsessed with the wild theories that he and many others were writing about. <laughs> He said, looking back, there was actually no evidence and it was all completely made up. But he's Dude, like, how does he sleep at night? I got my money. He, yeah. he doesn't care. He, you know, he, it's like it's your fault that you guys all bought into it. Yeah. He was just like it's going, going yeah. with the flow. Rudy has maintained his innocence, however, and he's still serving his 16 year sentence and was granted day release after nine years. Patrick spent two weeks behind bars after his arrest and his business never recovered. He said his business and life were completely destroyed by the false allegations and he believes, actually, that Amanda knows what happened to Meredith. In January 2010, Giuliano was convicted of abuse of power for his false accusations in the Monster Florence case. And after botching Meredith Kircher's case, too, he was still promoted to general prosecutor. He still got That's the promotion so, after this. Oh this is God. crazy. Raffaele has his own internet company in Italy, and he appears as a true crime expert for Italian television now. Amanda still lives in Seattle. She graduated college in 2014 and now advocates for the wrongfully convicted through a podcast she writes and produces with her husband called The Truth About True Crime. In 2016, she participated in that Netflix documentary we've been talking about. Overall, she thought it was an honest retelling of events, but she was disappointed with how it was promoted, actually. In 2019, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that her rights had been violated during the interrogation. She wasn't given a lawyer or a proper interpreter and the interrogation wasn't recorded, all of which she should have had under Italian law. So Italy was ordered to pay her $21,000 in damages. That same year, Amanda was invited by the Italy Innocence Project to speak about wrongful convictions and trial by media. And this was her first time back in Italy since being in prison. I'm sure that was intense. For yeah. Her. The highly publicized appearance was controversial, and many argued it was inappropriate to invite her to speak. Meredith's family is upset whenever they see Amanda back in the media. For them, it's a painful reminder of their loss and the lingering doubts about whether Meredith got real justice. I wonder if they have like a set idea of what they really think happened, you know, or yeah. are they just still confused like everyone else? I know. It'd be interesting to hear like their full mm -hmm. perspective on, mm -hmm. on their thoughts on it. Her mother said she was surprised Amanda and Raffaele were exonerated. Over eight years, they had two convictions and two acquittals. And to Meredith's family, everything is discredited now, and they're left with so many unanswered questions. Yeah, I'm sure they're so frustrated. Shortly before her death, Meredith was actually featured in a music video that now serves as a tribute to her. In 2009, Leeds University awarded her an honorary degree, and in 2010, the University for Foreigners in Perugia established a scholarship in her name. So obviously, at the end of all this craziness, you know, never mm -hmm. can forget about Meredith Kircher and all of this. And what a she, brutal murder. Yeah, this was a savage murder. I mean... And then how Rudy barely got any time and is yeah. just on daytime now. Like, yeah. are you kidding me? And it's very obvious he was involved in this. I mean, his, uh, yeah, sh his DNA his is everywhere. Shit is literally in the toilet. Like, yeah. In order to even pull off a brutal attack like that, mm -hmm. it would have had to have been somebody like him. And if Amanda and Raffaele had been there, there would have been their DNA there. I mean, mm -hmm. in a brutal attack like this, there would have been blood on them. There would have been some mm -hmm. traces of their DNA Something. at the crime scene. There's no way that you are involved in a brutal attack like this a where you're holding attack. people yeah. down. Yeah. There's blood flying any, everywhere that mm -hmm. your DNA is not there in some way, shape, or form. It just doesn't happen. It's, it's literally almost impossible for that to happen. Yeah. So it seems very clear to me that they were most likely not there or involved in it in any way. The only thing that I think could be remotely possible is that they somehow, she knew about it or knew what happened to her and she just has never said. But that's that's really it. I mean, it's possible. It's interesting that Patrick thinks that, you know, that maybe she knows something about what happened, really. And I wonder why. I wonder if there's more interviews with Patrick. But I totally feel for Meredith's family because mm -hmm. this is super hard. And, and honestly, they should be mad at the the Italian criminal justice system, especially at Giuliano, because he really like fucked this whole thing up so bad. majorly. But of course, we really want to know what you guys think. This one is tough, and we definitely have said there's times where we go back and forth, and maybe maybe she could have, but when you look at the actual evidence, there's just nothing. You there's know? nothing to con connect her to it. Mm -hmm. And all these mistakes. And why? It's just why? a shame, all these mistakes, too, and the way the media played into it. The whole case is such a shit show. And it's what just would be sad the for motive? Meredith. What would be the motive for Raffaele and Amanda? To do I know, this? there really doesn't seem like there would be. 
It would have to be some random thing. I don't yeah. Know. It's so strange. I mean, it seems pretty clear and obvious that this was a sexual attack mm-hmm. by Rudy. Yep. And that's it. That's what happened. And everything did happen the way that Amanda said afterwards. Mm-hmm. Seems like it. But again, there's still a lot of people out there, and I'm sure people yeah. in Italy that still think Amanda was involved. Yeah, I'm or, sure people you know, will disagree. Guilty mm-hmm. in some way. So. so let your voice be heard in our comment section. Let us know what you think really happened that night because we probably will never know what actually happened you know no and some people say that amanda knows exactly what happened and she just doesn't doesn't say maybe she does but again there's you know there's so much flip-flopping and stories being changed and you know Raffaele saying oh she didn't come home to 1 a.m so there's that window of time that amanda could have gone over there and then come back but then again i feel like you know there would have been more evidence Mm -hmm. of that if she had been there there would have been dna there and there just wasn't But that's going to be it for today's show. Again, leave your comments below. And we will be back next week with another true crime episode. We're going to be doing some true crime the next couple of weeks because we took a couple of weeks off of true crime. It can get intense. It really does. Like you can burn out easily in true crime. So we felt like we needed to just kind of take a little break from that. But now we're going to dive back in. So we'll be back next week. But thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Mile Higher Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate it. Yes. And until next time, keep taking your mind a A mile mile higher. higher.